Bright Attackers, I'm very excited to announce we have a very special guest on Zoom here, all the way from Los Angeles, California. People will know you from Night Run Elm Street 3. Yo, I thought I heard voices. It's time to stop guessing and start messing. Yo, Freddy, where you hiding at, you bright face pussy? That's where I was introduced to you. Mr. Ken Sagos. Hey, my kind of show. Glad to be here. How are you? How are you? Very good. Very good. I'm very excited to uh, talk to you. Um, I, I, obviously, we got in touch because you're going to be coming to Detroit soon. You're coming to the Motor City Legacy Horror Convention and Film Festival. That's that's quite the yes. name festival there. But uh, I'm really excited about this. Do you do a lot of like these uh, like ho like horror conventions? I you know I try to do at least two or three a year sometime uh, recently because see, I have a nonprofit organization, so all my signing and everything that I do it doesn't go to me personally. I can send kids to camp during the summer, and I pay for kids' books when they go to college. So this is where your money that you give me go to. So I, depending on how much I need and because of COVID, I refuse to let COVID stop me from giving back. So I thank you all out there in the horror world for helping me to continue to give back. Yes, COVID's definitely thrown a wrench in a few things uh, the past two years. <laughs> it's got to feel good though to get back out face-to-face uh, -face with people. It has to. And you, by the way, this is our 35th year anniversary for Nightmare on Elm Street 3. 35. That's a big movie. I'm uh, Five years. I, yes, that, that was a movie that, um, you know, we'll, we'll dive in and talk some Nightmare on Elm Street. We can, we can get back to the more Motor City legacy <laughs> here because uh, I'm really excited to talk about Nightmare on Elm Street. And this is going to sound silly. Uh, I told some friends this story and they thought I was making this up and I am truly not. The year of release, uh, like you said, this is the 35th anniversary of it. 35th. I, I was only eight years old uh, when I saw that movie for the first time. Um, I had three older brothers. So to be fair, they exposed me to a lot of movies I probably shouldn't have at that age. But this movie, it actually, it had a huge impact on my life. And it's, it's, it's funny because I have literally kept this movie in my head for all of these years because this movie at that age, when I was a kid seeing it and you have nightmares, this movie taught me that you can control your dreams. Like, believe it or not, when you guys did that in the movie and you learned about your powers, it changed the way that like I could dream at night at a young age. And from then on, every nightmare that I've had, it is like I've taught myself to control it and be able to like do cool things in my dreams. Like I will realize I'm in a dream and I can start flying and doing all cool sorts of stuff. And I've always credited it to this film uh, for Thank teaching you. me. Thank you. And I'm sure everybody, all the other fans, Joy and Hell than all of us, including Robert. We appreciate that. <laughs> so it is near and dear to my heart. So uh, obviously, playing Kincaid in this film, what was like the impact of this movie uh, when you got involved with it? Uh, I guess at its time, because this is kind of like I think the big springboard of the Nightmare on Elm Street franchise. Obviously, the first one was a big hit. I think two was kind of people didn't quite. I didn't think latch on to it like they did three. So how did that impact your life? You know, first of all, let me say this is that I had not watched any of the Nightmare movies before I got this role. I was like completely lost when, you know, my agent called me and told me about this movie. And it has impacted my life in more than ways that I can count. Number one, I hold the honor of being the first African American to survive a major horror film, international horror film, and return to a sequel. Yes. So that's number one. That's number one. That's amazing. And, and you know, I wasn't going to do it at first until um, an elderly lady got me to do it. 
And so uh, it changed my life because I think my character changed other people's life all over the world. It crossed race lines. Uh, you know, I still get messages, um, emails from Spain, from France, Germany, you know, of young people saying the things that you said. And I guess because Ken K, his dream power was something that was reachable. You know, it wasn't magic. It wasn't any of the other things. It was strength. It's something that you had to, you can go inside yourself and get. Mm -hmm. Not go inside and imagine that you could have and get. And I think that helped a lot of people. One of the reasons that I think that Nightmare 3 was so popular is because number one, it had a little of the old school and a little of the new school. But also it had something in there for everybody. Like, you know, it, it dealt with the, uh, the drug situation. It dealt with the mental situation. It dealt with the hospital. It dealt with belief. It dealt with something that was inside you. Everybody could relate to that. It wasn't about race. It wasn't about anything. It had unity in there. And to end it up, we had to realize that it was five of us more. But in order for us to come together, we had to come together as one. Somebody has to go in that doesn't want to. I'm in. Me too. Let's go kick the motherfuckers ass all over dreamland. And be a fisk and knock the hell out of Freddy. So <laughs> no, even though he got us at the end, but we became one fisk, one body, one body. And I think that Nightmare 3 had all of it. It had everything in it. It was a good ensemble mix of different characters that could reach, I think, all different aspects of people viewing. Uh, and I, yes, I, I believe you are 100% correct on that. I, I, I've heard somewhere you actually originally didn't want to audition for the role. Is that true? That is true. It, was, <laughs> it wasn't. No, that is true. Uh, it was because back then, you know, the agents got a breakdown and they would describe the characters that they are looking for. And at that time, they were looking for this guy with this slim waist, a bodybuilder type. He had to be physically fit. And I was nowhere near that, you know. So the agent wanted me to go to the audition and I didn't want to go. And number one, I had to go to court. It was raining like cats and dogs outside. <laughs> it was like, it wasn't like rain. It was pouring down rain. And I did not have a car. Oh. And where I had to go to court was on the east from where I live. And the audition was way on the west from where I live. <laughs> and I didn't have much money. I had to catch the bus. I went to court for my tickets. I didn't win. So now I had, to, I had to catch these two buses to get to this audition. Plus, I had to catch two buses to get there. So I had it all. By the end, I had an attitude. So to make a long story short, when I walked into the audition, there was all these guys with this nice build. It was like uh, Adonis, you know, the Olympics. That's who they were. And mm -hmm. I looked at me with a little puzzy gut. You know, why am I here? So, so when I finally went into the audition, I literally had an attitude <laughs> and the director thought I was acting. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I, I kind of like, he said, be natural with you. And I said something like, ain't no black guy going to say this shit, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so he said, say it how you would say it. And so I said, and so when I got home, finally, plus I, I missed my bus. To, so to get finally, home? 
to get home. Oh. See, my plan was to go in and get this audition. It was like at four o'clock. There was a 420 bus that left. If I go in and get this audition, I'd be out because I don't fit the road, be out about four or five, run down to the bus stop, catch my 425 bus, and I'd be headed home. <laughs> that was the plan. But when I got there, they was almost an hour behind. And by then, the buses was running every hour. So when I finally got home, my phone was ringing. I picked it up. And that was pre, uh, that was like beepers then. It wasn't no yeah. <laughs> big ass answer machine that looked like a suit. <laughs> and it was raining. And I picked it up. And it was my agent. He had called up 30 something times. And he said, Ken. What the hell did you do down there? And I said, David, I told you I didn't want to go. And he said, they loved you. <laughs> <laughs> that's how I got, to, that's basically how I got to roll. So it's almost, I mean, it's a good thing then you didn't like use up your luck on winning the tickets because then it might have flip flop reverse on the, the audition. So like everything happens for a reason, right? Everything happened for a reason, I, I, and I would say that, you know, and I and I went in with this attitude. They was looking for a guy with an attitude and, <laughs> and who didn't want to be there. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't want to be there, and it, and it actually showed. And so I guess that was Ken K. He didn't want to be there. Yeah, perfect. Which, you know, it's interesting because you say that, you know, people that were there were, um, you know, super, you know, the built muscle bound people, but I, I honestly think that would hurt the well, character. Most of them, most of them had on them now uh, wife beater t-shirts. Oh, okay. They were like they show their muscles. You know, <laughs> I, I couldn't wear that. But I almost think that takes away now from the strength power, as I, I like the idea that the, the character is not that because when you get your strength in your dreams, it should be something that isn't obviously something of your normal life. So I'd like, I, I think it would make sense not to go with somebody that's already <laughs> showing off. I can say, and that's the first time that has been brought up to me. And I think that was one of the reasons that people like my character is because he could have been anybody, you yes. know, that was so, you know, he went in there and he did it. He was determined. No, you're not going to do this to me. And he didn't look like what a man is supposed, young man is supposed to be to be strong. Mm -hmm. He was, he was borderline chubby. If he wasn't chubby, according to the uh, doctor, I was obese. <laughs> yeah, the BMI <laughs> chart. <laughs> yeah, if I go by the chart, I was obese. So. <laughs> No, it's, it's, it, it was a great character because, I mean, the psychology behind it, I mean, he's putting on a persona of a tough character, pushing people away, truly, I think, scared um, and trying to hide behind uh, like a, a false strength, which then he gets to develop in his nightmares to embrace that strength. And I, and I like like what you said earlier, the reality of the strength was like he wasn't an incredible hawk he was like he could throw two or three people he had some more strength but he wasn't they didn't go too carried away or magical like you said like the wizard powers and he was, it was still relatable he was reachable to people who dream mm -hmm. he was reachable you know and i think that's what why everybody liked it and, and he had a smart mouth <laughs> yes he did <laughs> he a smart mouth he he could go head to head with Freddie in two major uh, ways. He had the strength and he could also, what we call in the inner city, play the dozens. <laughs> talk about you just as much as you talked about him. All the way till the end too. Uh, I'll see you in hell. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I, it's interesting you bring that up in the audition. You mentioned that you know those aren't words that you don't think he'd say. Did you kind of change some of the dialogue throughout filming or have a hand in? Because there's some great lines of Kincaid throughout the, uh, this film that I uh, did. You have a hand? 
that's a wonderful line from Ken Cage. And I think a lot of it has to do with how the lines were delivered because I I was in school, I could always talk what they call shit back, you know. So <laughs> it had to be an act and I still call it that. Like you had to you had to be able to talk some shit. And I think <laughs> I had a gift to talk. Back then when I was in high school, see I ran track. So I could talk shit and run and get away. <laughs> <laughs> So oh, the character was talking shit. So as far as the line, as a writer myself, I am conscious about changing other writers' lines. But the director gave me a little leeway when it came down to certain uh, lines. Because originally, Kincaid was not for a Black actor. Kincaid was for a white actor. OK. And so it, um, they allowed me to change some of the lines, like, you know, you burnt face <laughs> pussy was not in there. You know? Yeah. One of my favorites. <laughs> <laughs> Especially the way it was delivered. I love the, <laughs> come on up. Where you at, you burnt face pussy? Yeah, where you at? <laughs> so, I mean, you know, so that wasn't in there. So, uh, little things like that the director would let me change the lines. He would let me say something different. And I think it had gotten approved by the other writers. I think it was two or three writers on it, including Wes Craven. Mm -hmm. So uh, they was okay about it. That's great, because I think that obviously helps for a creative to grow the character. And it truly paid off, because I think Kincaid's one of the most memorable characters of the, the film. Thank um, you. And I credit you for, for doing that. And I credit, I guess, everybody for allowing that freedom to, in, you know, to, to engage yeah. in that type of, because yeah, there are some writers that get very strict and- They do. They, if you, I, I've been with a director, he, I missed one word and he would go, it was a monologue and he would go all the way back and we would have to change that. It was, and a female you know, females uh, and di director and a male director, they was very particular about their lines in their script. So right. um, so I try to be on point with that because I do understand, I do understand. Right. So the cast in Nightmare on Elm Street 3, along with yourself, I mean, that it's, you look at the cast today and it's amazing the people that are involved. I mean, you had Lawrence Fishburne, Patricia Arcat. Uh, yeah. I think a, a big thing with John Saxon coming back and then also uh, bringing back Nancy, Heather Langenkamp. Uh, bringing her back, I think, was a big deal in the, the storytelling because obviously the main character from the original. Uh, what was the feeling I set? Like, did you guys know, like, it, was there that feeling that, like, this was going to be, like, a big hit while making the film, knowing that you're tying this into the original, like you said, and while going a new path because I think you know when you look back I think the first film Freddy Krueger is only in it like 13 minutes I think he's in like the second film only eight minutes and then this I think was that transition of more Freddy um could you feel that on set that this was going to be something different as I stated before I had not watched Nightmare on Elm Street prior before that and I did not watch it before I walked on the set. Now, what I credit Chuck Russell, the director, with is that when we all the kids was cast, he got us all together a couple of times. And to get, you know, we had a little party, a little get, get together. So we got to know each other. And Hilda Landon Camp was not there. We just got together all the kids. So, and I say that to say that, so when we got on the set, because one of the first scenes that we filmed was the scene in the hospital where we all, when all I said, fuck you, you sit down, oh, Nash, my dick is killing me. It was all around in that circle. So we had an investment in each other. We was friends. We had became friends before we went to the set. And then we all knew about Heather and Camp. 
and we didn't actually see her until we filmed. So her so, coming in. So we heard, rehearsed. That was that was my first day meeting Helga and Nikhil. Oh wow! So it creates that shock kind so of. Uh, was, so a lot of it was real, and since we're talking about that moment, I always, for me, like to give homage. And I, at that moment, I give homage to Lawrence Fishburne because I was ex exhausting myself going crazy playing that role when he went to take me out. And he took me to the side and he said, look, you can't work that hard. You don't have to work that hard. And it may not mean nothing to him or to others, but he taught me how to do physically acting right there on that set wow. and i i and i always thank you for that and i always give him credit for it that's amazing so uh as far as robert england's concerned uh filming was he uh, i guess obviously always going to be a makeup and set uh during filming does he stay in character does he have fun with it with you guys where there's some pranks well, or anything he, going on he has fun you know, it, Robert England, he's at all four corners of the world. He's just a gifted, gifted artist. Yes. And you, if you spend 10 minutes with Robert England, it's almost like you just had a class at Harvard or Yale. Oh, wow. Because he's, he's so knowledgeable. He has worked with so many people. He's a... Uh, Shakespearean trained actor. He can play comedy, he can play drama. He's one of the most underrated actors, I believe, that's out there. And when he's usually when I came in, he was sitting in the uh, makeup chair. And usually when I left, he was sitting in the makeup chair. <laughs> he was in the makeup chair getting makeup on. So sometimes that makeup took hours to get on and hours to take off. So when I came there, and he always had such a personality. He had a bubbly personality. But when they said action, the personality went away and that Freddy Krueger came in. Such a transformation because you look back at, at, at the evolution of you know, for his career of, I mean, he was, he was kind of the comic relief character on V yeah. and they take a chance on him to play this, <laughs> this Freddy Krueger character. And then it's interesting to see the evolution of Freddy Krueger, because you could see the character evolved where he actually got to become used more of that comic, uh, yeah. to bring that personality through this character. And, 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 it, and it takes a, it's a, it takes a different type for an actor to do that. You know, I know they did that remake and that the other actor played Freddie, which I thought I went to it and I thought it was he did a wonderful job. Uh what was it, Haley? I think he did a wonderful job as Freddie. However, I have to say there would never ever be a Robert Eager as Freddie. No. No. And, and so and so when he act, but I don't say that he did not do a good job. He did. Yeah, I, I actually liked his interpretation. I thought the voice was really creepy. Why are you screaming? I haven't even caught you yet. <laughs> um, to me, it was it was scary. Uh, and I think Freddy's just such an iconic character. It's not really fair to put anybody else in that role because right. you're gonna you're gonna compare to Robert England and the courage of the courage to do that, you know, the courage to do that. Only someone who is good can do that. So, right. so you mentioned earlier you survived Nightmare on Elm Street through. I think we're beyond the spoiler alert uh, time frame here, uh, so we can give that away. Uh, and part four comes along. I, I always kind of had an issue with part four. Uh, you had an issue. <laughs> What happened to the dream, the the powers? Because I felt like it seemed like that kind of got it was just gone, and I was I kept waiting for when Kincaid's there and like start using some strength, like the super strength, and it seemed like they kind of did away with that. Was that kind of discussed or? 
just kind of no it wasn't on. discussed it wasn't discussed i i do know that um they uh wanted to bring patricia Arquette back mm -hmm. and for some reason i don't know what the reason uh reasons were she didn't come back but let me also say this tuesday night stepped in and she did a marvelous job mm -hmm. stepping in as Kristen. And a lot of people don't realize it is that she was the first one to meet me and, and Rodney Eastwood, who played Joey, when we came to the set to, to film. It wasn't like we went somewhere, we had to go on a set. She came to us, introduced herself, and she made this connection with us. So I, I'm saying this because a lot of people, you know, they say because she came in, she didn't do this here. She did a wonderful job. I don't think they could have got a better actress than to play than Tuesday night. And once again, once they said action, Tuesday became Kristen and she tore that role up. And so um Again, I don't know. I, I think because this is my thinking now. I think because when um, Patricia or Kit didn't come back, it diminished our role. And I think in part four, they wanted to get with the new kids. So they had to get the older kids out. You know, we were the seniors. Mm -hmm. So we had to graduate. And he had to deal with the freshman. And that wasn't anything against me, my performance, or Rodney, or anything. It was called show business and keeping the way it is. So did the script. Now, if you had asked me, Ken Sago, he would have been all the way through there. I would still be keeping the way there. <laughs> That's me. I don't think anyone would have a problem with that. That's. Just... <laughs> I think I think that you know, forget Freddie versus Jason. I think we need to get a Freddie versus King K. <laughs> yeah! <laughs> there was a rumor. I don't know how true it is, but there was a rumor that if you look at the end of when I died, Nightmare Four, I tell Freddie I will see you in hell. I understand later I was told there was talks about me coming back and my soul was trapped in limbo and I was going to come back and it was going to be a major fight between me and Freddie. Um, that's, you know, but no one ever told me that, no executive, nobody at New Line ever told me any of that. But, you know, but it makes sense because uh, I told him I would see you in hell. There was a big setup there. Yeah. And the setup, obviously, with the souls becoming a bigger player in the storyline that I kept waiting for that at the end of four of like, I think, you know, once you guys get freed, you can be there. But uh, Kincaid's story did continue in the comic books. I don't know if you've followed those, but he has come back in the comics to. Uh, Was help. someone sending me a comic book? I did not have <laughs> a comic book. I, you know, I, I, someone sent me a game where I was kicking butt. You know, it was like a video game. And I do have one comic book. I have one comic book. But uh, I, I've i never, I understand there was more than one comic book. I would like to see those comic books. Yeah, I, I've, I've, I saw there were two comics that Kincaid came back. So I'm real curious. Uh, do you have them? I do not have them. I, I learned of them, so I need to find them myself. And I, I didn't want to find out any spoilers because I want to I want to read that on my own and and experience okay. it. So when you find <laughs> out where you can buy one, that let me know. So uh, are you excited about the the Motor City event? It's uh, March eighteenth. I am weekend. I am very excited. I have not been there. You know, I, let me take that back. I about twenty years ago. I was on tour in a play and we went through there, did the play on a Friday and Saturday night, came in on that Thursday night, did the play on Friday and Saturday and left out on that Sunday. But that was it. 
quick in and out. So are you coming in for, you'll be here uh, the whole weekend or is this a, a... I'm I'm there the whole weekend. Fantastic. Autographs. Yeah. Now you, you have a special going. Uh, I want to alert the attackers watching of the special. You've got a coupon. It's a limited number. I have a coupon. If you can see, this is the coupon. It's going to be 40 of these bad boys. 40? 40. 40 um, uh, it's going to be 40 uh, totaling. And if you can see, you can get a poster or a 8 by 10 plus I'm going to have t-shirts. Fantastic. Plus I'm going to not only t-shirts, I'm going to have uh, wristbands. As you can see, wristbands are going to say Freddy's back. Night, Nightmare on Elm Street Part 3 and 4. And also included in that will be a um, bookmark on one part three. On the other side will be part four. Very nice. That don't kick it. You can always you get you can decide to get a dog tag. Now one side will say part three. Part four. What? The other side will say part three. Now, if you want to take that dog tag like so many other people and make it out of a keychain, you can do that. Multifunctional. Yeah, you, you can you can do that. So that is the package. Technically, it's worth more than one hundred and twenty-five dollars value, but. I'm taking fifty dollars off, so it'll be seventy-five dollars. Seventy-five dollars for all that, and that's also a picture with you. A picture with me, a selfie. That's what y'all call them, right? A selfie, yeah. <laughs> and an autograph. That's fantastic. So, and it because let me tell you why. It's because I have an organization where I support kids, and I'm all my funds go to kids. Now, let me say not all of it. 90% of it goes to kids. I got to be able to go and get me something to eat. <laughs> <laughs> and you started this, uh, you started this uh, organization, was it 2009? No, I started this in 1997. 97. And so far I have put over 660 kids through college. Wow. I sent a whopping, you know, uh, more than four or 500 kids to go to summer camp. And I put more than 5,000 supplies in schools across the United States. And I, I, and I do this about because I promised God that if I got to a level in this career, that I was gonna always feel back because I know what it's like to go to school and you can't afford your books. I know what it's like. I know what it's like to be sitting outside, seeing the bus during the summer, seeing the bus go by, and it's loaded with children going to camp. But your mother, you didn't have the money to go to camp, so that's why I make sure that I send some kids to camp and I pay for some kids' books. And it's not just in LA, you know. I send little things to kids all over the world to Australia, a young man that I sent something to Australia and to encourage him. So it's, it's, it's what I do, you know, it's what I enjoy doing. It's, 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 I, I like to believe on a spiritual sense now. I like to believe that if God says time to come home, I want to be able to say I was trying to make a difference. That's why the name of my organization is giving back and at the end it says everybody can make a difference and that's something that me. now also what i'm trying to do i got my short film coming out and called the secret weapon and it's about um the kids in 1963 who gave the power back to the civil rights movement there was a villain called a racist, very racist, iconic racist named Boa Connor. And these children went head to head to fight Boa Connor. 
and he was the Freddy Krueger. So that's what the movie is about. And the reason that I bring this up is because I'm getting ready to go into post-production, so I need some funds for my post-production too. Okay. So um, it's because um, Bull Connor was not the Freddy Krueger then. But when I do my short film, when it comes to the co uh, associate producers and co-producers, there's a line that say from the horror community because the horror community has been so supportive on me. And I could not do this film without giving homage to the horror community. That's beautiful. And there is a, obviously outside of meeting you at the convention and purchasing this or taking advantage of the, the coupon, there is a different, they can also donate as well directly, correct? I have a donate box there. I don't have a uh, donate box there. Um, you know, and so and, and all my stuff goes to a purpose. It is there a website a link? Is there a way that people could donate online? Donate. I'm going to set up something. It would be the sagoscompany.com. Okay. And I can, I'll include a link to that directly in the description here of the video. So people can click down below once we're all done. And, uh, yeah. if they'd like to make a donation, please do, because this is a great cause and it's an amazing thing that you're doing. And I commend you for that. That's Thank you. that's very and very my generous. It's a nonprofit organization, so if you want to write a big check, you can write it off. Again. <laughs> <laughs> so the short film uh, is this a, a film that you wrote? Correct. It's a short film that I wrote. It's called "The Secret Weapon." Yesterday is today, and it's um, the reason I say yesterday is today is because what is going on in the world today happened years ago. It's the same thing. Um, I had to, this is one of the posters and it's called Yesterday is Today. As you can see, if you look at this picture, you see the cop has the knee on the guy and the dog is going at the guy. If you look at those pictures, you're going to say this picture was two years ago, but this is also a picture from 1963. This is a picture from 1963. So it's almost like we're repeating ourselves. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and that's why I have, I give so much homage to the horror community because they when I needed money to get ready to film this here, they sent me money. They sent me a dollar here. You know, I had little things that I was doing. So I want to say, if, if nothing else, thank you. I, I am appreciative. And when I do my short film, I'm going to make sure that I can say, produce, co-produce by the horror community. Well, hopefully Detroit steps up big uh, and we we get some money raised for you here uh, yeah. at the Motor City Legacy. So yeah. you, you're you're in a post production currently. So is this is this you've got this filmed? I filmed it, but you know, in post production, there's a lot of things that I have to do because of COVID. I could not put the amount of kids in the jails that I needed. Mm. So what I'm going to have to do is do some little special effects in there. Right. And also, um, when I first filmed it, it was filmed on a, uh, in a real studio with a real jail cell. So then I had to reshoot it. So I actually built me a cell with cardboard. You know? <laughs> it looked, I made it look as real as I can. But, you know, I, if I'm going to present this, I need to fix all those things. I need to have looping. I need to have all those things for post-production. And I need to be able to hire an editor, a good editor that can understand the situation. Believe me, I'm going to put up the trailer next week. Okay. But believe me, it was a horror story as to what happened to those kids mm -hmm. so but it was real it was not fake it was real so you know and, 
And my last short film, by the way, that I did a couple of years ago, it won me over 200 awards wow. across the world. 200 awards. And I actually received um, 46 best short film, and I received about 20 best directors. Congratulations. So yeah, so that's my goal. But I'm back into acting now. I'm back. I'm, 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 I'm back. Or say, oh, Sago's will be back in front of the screen. <laughs> I love it. I can't wait. So, so any, I, of you, any of you horror, horror directors out there, and it's a sad film, and you need a good actor, I have a little bit of, you know, training. Just a little bit. <laughs> you want old Ken K, Ken Sago to be in it, and it's a sad film. Don't call me with no non-union. I can't do non-union. Call me, we can work something out. <laughs> and Detroit's got a pretty good film market. Uh, unfortunately, we kind of lost the incentives a couple of years ago, and it it, it kind of it hurt us a little bit. But there's still a pretty thriving film industry going on here in Detroit. Uh, really? and one thing, I, didn't know that. I did not know that. Yeah, we've uh, it's it's independent right now, but they are working on getting the film incentives back. Um, you know, we we had some major films shot here with the incentives: Batman v Superman, the Transformer films. You know, you can oh. see a lot of Detroit in those movies. Uh, so uh, we're hoping to get some incentives back and we're working really hard at that happening. I did want to ask you to kind of pivot your, uh, you said earlier you're in LA. Uh, I saw you were born in Georgia and Georgia is a pretty big acting community now. It's, it's, I feel like it's kind of rivaling Hollywood. Rivaling Hollywood now. So I, I, I want to become bi-coastal, you know, uh, and I do, my family is still in Georgia. Okay. And I was born in Stockbridge, Georgia, uh, where the King family lived at the time. My grandmother and grandfather was actually very close family to Daddy King. And wow. believe it or not, oh God, I can tell my age, I had the honor of meeting him. I didn't know who I was meeting at the time. Wow. But, you know, I, I grew up surrounded by all of that and surrounded by all those horrible things that you think that you just see today. I experienced some of those when I was growing up. So I, from Stockbridge, I grew up in Atlanta. Um, and then I moved out here to pursue acting. And I went to UCLA extension program i when i first moved out here i got a job at universal studios where i met the great average hitchcock and i got a chance and as a security guard working at universal studios i got a chance to meet some of the old legends of yesterday who took time to talk to me so i feel that the things that i do I owe them some type of payback. And the best way that I could pay it back is to move forward and do some stuff with respect. And so I bet many of them from, like I said, Alfred Hitchcock, George Byrne, Lucille Ball, uh, they all took time to talk to me. And so um, that's where I am today. That's amazing. That is quite a catalog. So, hey, maybe full circle, you're going back to Georgia. We'll get uh, get some, it, some. It is my hope. It is my hope that I have written. Um, I never got on drugs. I never did any of that. My cocaine became writing. So I have a catalog of about 40 or 50 scripts. That's my catalog. Wow. My thing is, is that hope and many of them have that southern flavor in it. You know, I, I'm a country boy. I'm proud of being a country boy. Hey. <laughs> and I want to go back there and I want to feel, feel my story. I got this story called Tomato Chari. Ah, I think it's gonna be great. Yeah, that that's the that's the uh the pride project there that's uh private project. I think it's gonna be the one. You wanna know who liked that story? was Robin Williams. Really? 
Robin William liked that story. Wow. And made it solid. So you got to meet him as well. You got to meet him as well. That's uh it's truly sad that he is gone today because that, that we were lucky to have him. That truly a legend there. Well, that's exciting then. So uh, obviously you uh, you said the short films that you work on, you uh, did a lot of film festival circuits. Do you take the scripts as well and kind of enter like the script festivals? And I haven't entered the script festivals yet. I just have entered myself as a director, you know, and because I want to eventually direct. And so I think my goal was to get two powerful short films and get them together. I, I completed one and this is my second one. And I don't want to do it half ass. I mm -hmm. want to do it with some respect. I got some great young actors, older actors as well. The guy that plays Bull Connor is just phenomenal, you know. And um and so I'm hoping to have this finished by May. And I'm hoping to have something up so I can get donations. I need to raise me about another 15 to 20 grand to do it. And I'm going to do it. I'm going to, yep. leave. I'm going to do it. You know, so. I believe and, you will. Yeah, I'm going to do it. You know, getting this done is Kincaid against Freddy Krueger. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Well, we will include the link to the trailer below as well in the description. I'm really excited to see it when you drop it. Uh, so we'll include that as well in the description. So when people are watching this and you want to see the trailer, the link yeah. is below. Uh, also, I have the information below for the Motor City Legacy uh, Horror Convention. So people can find the information for that. Purchase your tickets. And the first, if, if, the first one, and they're going to email you, I think, or something. The first 20, I will hold these for you until two o'clock on Saturday. So there you go, attackers. Send me a DM. Let me know if you want these coupons. He's going to set aside 20 of them exclusively for you. That's an attack on show exclusive. That's that's huge. And I look and I will be there. I will be, I look forward to meeting you in person. Uh, I'm definitely going to take advantage of that package because I do want the poster. I got a cool movie set, movie room set up downstairs that's going to look perfect in. So I'm really excited to meet you in person that weekend. But I want to thank you for taking your time and talking with me here on Attack on Show. This has been an absolute pleasure. And uh, we look forward to seeing you at the Motor City Legacy. Yes, I'm now be in touch. Thank you a lot. Hey, fucking A. <laughs> <laughs>